Good afternoon to everybody joining us. We're just gonna give it a minute here and let everyone join us. If you wanna um, type in the chat where you're joining us from across the Chesapeake Bay watershed, that'd be great. We get to know who's joining us this afternoon. For those just joining us, whether you're on Zoom with us or whether you're on Facebook with us, if you want to type in the chat where you're coming, coming from across the Chesapeake or the region, we'd love to know where you're joining us from this morning. This afternoon, sorry, it's now officially afternoon. We're just going to get started in a couple seconds here. Welcome, Benina. Welcome, Sally. Welcome, Hillel. All right, well, we're going to get started here. Um, welcome to the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay's Breakfast on the Bay series. Um, we're pushing the breakfast definition a little bit today, pushing it to lunchtime. So we'll say it's lunch on the bay today. Uh, but for those I have not yet met, my name is Kate Fritz, and I have the honor of serving as the CEO of the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay. So you are here joining us for our signature summer uh, live talk series. Um, we're really celebrating the 18 million communities, companies, and conservationists who live, work, and play in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Um, and just so you all know, the Alliance is celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. We're celebrating five decades of convening diverse voices and leveraging resources to implement solutions for clean water in your local rivers and streams that lead to the Chesapeake Bay. So the Alliance works in four different program areas, including agriculture, forests, green infrastructure, and stewardship and engagement. And we do that work across the entirety of the 64,000 square mile Chesapeake Bay watershed, which starts in Cooperstown, New York, and ends in Southern Virginia. So we have offices located in Annapolis, Maryland, where our headquarters is located, an office in Richmond, Virginia, Washington, DC, and in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So as an organization, the Alliance values three things. We value collaboration, where we believe in partnering across sectors and regions to achieve a larger, more collective impact. We value inclusivity, where we are partners who demonstrate integrity and we amplify diverse voices for an equitable impact. And our third value as an organization is being results driven. We drive with data to help promote informed action. And we hold ourselves and our partners accountable for measurable, measurable impact. And we're gonna talk a little bit today about our work around community and volunteer science um, and how we utilize that data to uh, drive measurable impact. So in celebration of our 50th anniversary, we're bringing 50 stories to life this year. Each story features individuals, projects, ideas, places, and partnerships representing five decades of restored lands and waters of the Chesapeake Bay. We'll be sharing a link in the chat to those inspiring stories so you can check them out and learn what we've been up to for the last five decades. If you're joining us from Zoom or Facebook, you can use the chat function to enter any in any questions, and we'll be sure to get those to our presenters here, who I'm going to introduce in just a second. Um, you can uh, utilize the chat box, enter your question. We'll be sure to get those to Liz and Sophie to help us answer later on in our program this afternoon. So lastly, before we get started, I really want to thank our donors who've made this talk possible. Our 50 years of on-the-ground work would not be possible without you. So in honor of our 50th anniversary, our board and our generous donors are providing a $25,000 match gift to any donation made to the Alliance this summer. So any donation you make will be doubled one-to-one -one this summer. We hope you'll contribute and continue to support us uh, into the next 50 years of the challenges of the Chesapeake. So this morning, uh, or this afternoon, uh, I'm excited to bring, uh, bring our work to life in the fields of Virginia for a hands-on presentation around how the training that we provide to volunteer scientists to collect high quality water quality data. The work that we do is in our River Trends program. Um, and this is a program we have been administering as an organization for the last 40 years. 
And in that time, we've helped train over 700 community scientists to help collect over 36,000 data points across the Chesapeake. This data is utilized by state agencies like the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality to help inform policy decisions regarding protection of our local waterways. So I'm gonna end there because I wanna leave our experts to, to give you the insight and information on how we train uh, community scientists and leaders to help collect data. So I'm excited to introduce Liz Chudoba, who is the Alliance's Water Quality Monitoring Initiative Director, and Sophie Stern, who's our Water Quality Monitoring Project Coordinator, uh, who are in Reedy, uh, Reedy Creek today in outside of Richmond in Virginia, and they're being supported by Lucy Heller, our Engagement Specialist. So Liz, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Great, are we good to go and can you hear us? She has a thumbs up. Perfect, <laughs> hear you well. Sounds good, hey everybody. I'm Liz Chudoba and I'm Sophie Stern. And as Kate mentioned, we're here today to talk to you about our water quality monitoring project. So mainly this is River Trends. And as Kate mentioned, we've been running this project for 40 years and the data used by this project is used by the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality. They use it to help supplement where they can monitor versus where we can send out volunteers. So it really supplements their data set and gives us a better idea of the water quality in the state of Virginia. And more recently in 2015, we also started a, a similar project that that expands river trends called the Chesapeake Monitoring Cooperative or the CMC. And this was started in partnership with the Chesapeake Bay Program. And so we have four additional partner organizations that act as service providers across the watershed, working with similar programs to river trends, working with community volunteers and the volunteers out there collecting water quality data to bring it under a larger umbrella and to house all of this data in one centralized place. So now in addition to the state partners that use this data, the Chesapeake Bay program is also using our data. So Sophie's now gonna give a little bit more detail. <laughs> all right, um, so just a little more background on our River Trends program. We uh, provide the training equipment and any support that volunteers all over the state within the Chesapeake Bay watershed need to go out and collect water quality samples. Right now we have about 120 volunteers that are collecting samples every single month year round at about 100 or so sites, um, which is really wonderful to have. Um, we provide the trainings for these monitors every single year. And then we ask that our monitors are regularly recertified each year as well. So they can stay up to date on any uh, changes to our equipment um, or changes to our protocol. And we can just check that they're doing everything properly in the field. And that's really just so we can ensure really high quality data collection. Um, so before we jump into the rest of our program for the day, uh, we're, we have a little video to share for you guys from one of our monitors up in the Fredericksburg, Virginia area. Uh, David Steinberger. So I'm going to turn that over to our behind the scenes crew to share that video. So my name is David Steinberger. I am a middle and upper school science teacher here at Fredericksburg Academy in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Um, I've been at FA for eight years and I've been working for the Alliance doing volunteer work for a little over three years at this point. So we're at Deep Run Creek. This creek feeds into the Rappahannock River, so it's obviously part of the Chesapeake Bay watershed. We're pretty close to the headwaters. The headwaters are about half mile to a mile um, upstream to the west of us. And we're probably about three, four-ish miles from the Rappahannock here. My favorite part, in all honesty, is getting students out here to engage in real world science. So um, a lot of my students, when they first come to me, envision science as, hey, I'm going to wear this white lab coat and goggles and be in a lab in a very sterile environment. And while certainly that's a part of science, that's definitely not the entire spectrum of what scientists do. So to expose them to science that happens outside is a big plus for me. And then to have something they're doing that's more of a longitudinal study where it's not just a one and done lab, but every month we're gonna to come to the spot and we're gonna test these numbers for them to see that science can be an ongoing process and that we can see trends over a long period of time. It's pretty awesome. I believe that especially for young people, there's a disconnect between if they're just learning something on a screen or in a book versus doing it hands-on. Um, they can certainly learn the content, no question asked, whether it being online or in a book. 
but it seems like something happening out there. Somebody else is doing it. Um, somebody else has figured this out. And it has this degree of separation between themselves and the material. When I think students get outside and they actually engage in doing it, there's that connection, that aha moment of, oh, wait a minute, maybe I'm actually a scientist. Maybe I can actually contribute to science, and maybe it's not just this foreign thing that other people are doing. When I started, I had some expectations as to what I might find, but I feel like I now have a relationship with this creek, um, and I can make a prediction as to what I'm going to find on a monthly basis, whether it's what's the dissolved oxygen be like in the summertime versus the winter, or when do I expect there's going to be a spike in bacteria. I've gotten to learn a little bit of the cycles that have happened. I, I didn't expect to pick up on it. I'll be honest, when I first started, I was a little overwhelmed with all the chemistry going into the titrations and all that kind of thing. And um, it now seems more like second nature. So I really enjoyed developing that relationship. It can be very overwhelming to think about all the things that are happening in the world right now. Um, this is something that we can control on an individual level do that makes a pretty big difference that um, we have a watershed here that if we can focus more on it and, and do something like monthly water quality testing or as simple as just uh, picking up trash along a river, it can make a big difference and we can make an impact. Okay. Can everyone hear me again? Okay. Are we getting a thumbs up there? I can't see. All right. Uh, we're going to assume you. We can hear you well. Yep. Great. Right. Thank you. It's very hard to do this when we can't see what's happening on the back end. Um, all right. So uh, I'm glad that you guys got to hear from David. He's one of our all star monitors uh, who's been around for quite a few years engaging his students. Um, we are out here today at Reedy Creek along the James River. Uh, this is a very popular public access point. Uh, we've been monitoring here for many years now. Um, so we're going to walk you through what a typical day sampling looks like. Uh, sometimes we have people who go out in pairs to sample. Uh, they monitor at recreational access points. Sometimes they monitor in their backyard, which can be really helpful um, when it's private property that we can still have samples from that area. Uh, but we do have a lot of people who monitor on their own as well. Um, so typically when someone goes out to the site, they bring all their supplies with them, uh, which we have scattered around us, we'll show you in a little bit, uh, and they are collecting samples on um, observational data, so what you see around them. Uh, and then we have uh, air and water temperature, bacteria, dissolved oxygen, um, water clarity, um, conductivity, and salinity in tidal regions. I think that was all of them. Um, and these parameters change based on sort of the needs of the group that's monitoring or just the interests of the volunteers. Um, so typically when we come out to a site, everyone has their River Trends methods manual with them. So this is like their guide to everything that they're gonna do in the field. Cause it can be a lot at first when you get started. Um, and this sort of just walks you through step-by-step. Step. We want this program to be accessible for everyone and we use equipment that is affordable and uh, easy to use. We just want everyone to build their water quality who wants to. Um, before we come out in the field, actually, we do some quality assurance checks on our equipment, and that's really to ensure that we're collecting that really high quality data so that we know the data that you're collecting and writing down on your data sheets is excellent data that can be used. Um, when we do, so we've done all those checks behind the scenes, so we're not going to spend any time on that today, but the whole front of our data sheet is walking through those checks, and then the back of the data sheet is when you actually get out into the field. So the first thing that you'll do is write down your station ID because some of our monitors have more than one site. Um, so that depends on your site, what that will be. Uh, and then you just look around and you record some of your observations. So there's check boxes on our data sheet. We have water surface today. I'd call this a pretty calm day. Uh, our stream flow, I'd call this low for the time of year that it is. Uh, weather conditions, we have a beautiful hot sunny day here. Very some hot. Say. Anita. Very hot. We're, <laughs> we're pushing mid 90s here. Our water color looks pretty normal, a little cloudy. We did have a huge rain event a couple days ago. Uh, we are not in a tidal area um, and it looks pretty average for this time of year, which is good. Um, so once we do that, uh, the first thing that we do is collect a bacteria sample. So I'm going to turn it over to Liz to walk us through how we do that. So we use the Coliscan Easy Gel method for bacteria. We don't collect bacteria at all of our sites. This is really more of something that's collected if there's a specific area of 
interest or a specific concern by our volunteers that they really want to track bacteria over time. Um, so what we're doing is using the CauseScan Easy Gel method, we are going to actually count the E. coli bacteria that's in this waterway. And E. coli isn't necessarily um, a pathogen or bad for you in and of itself, but E. coli really acts as an indicator species. So that, can, that really just tells us that there might be a presence of a sewage leak or some other pathogens in the water that might be of concern for human contact. So the important thing when we're taking our bacteria sample, as Sophie mentioned, we always take this one first because we wanna reduce contamination. So we always wanna use sterile techniques, be really careful when we're taking these samples um, so that we don't contaminate our sample. So we are gonna head over to the waterway and just grab a sample real quick. Um, so most of our sites, you either walk into the waterway and collect all of your samples, we do also have the option of collecting a sample in a bucket to take back to um, the shoreline if that's easier. So using sterile techniques, we wanna hold the bottle from the base of the bottle so that, and we're gonna go in a U motion away from our hand in order to make sure that we're not introducing any additional bacteria. We're also gonna just remove the lid and then take our sample and then immediately put the lid right back on. We're not putting the lid on the ground or any other places so that we can, again, reduce the contamination. Um, these are pretty small bottles. We only use a few milliliters of sample. So anything greater than half of the bottle is plenty for us to take our sample. Um, so we can head back over to our bacteria station. So we would put this into a cooler when we left the site and take it back home or to our office or to a lab, wherever we're gonna analyze the sample. And we would plate it on, we, there's special media that grows the E. coli bacteria. And we would plate it and then incubate this sample for either 48 hours at room temperature or 24 hours at about 98 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're gonna skip that process and just show you what the results look like. So these plates were taken yesterday at this site. And what we're looking for here are these dark blue colonies. So the red colonies are a different kind of area. We're not gonna worry about here. What we're really looking for are these dark blue, navy blue, they can even be a little purplish um, colonies. So we have two plates here that were taken. This one's not, this one kind of needed a little bit more incubation. Um, it's not great. <clears throat> um, so we'll go with this plate. This, I count two colonies on this plate. And then just for reference, you can kind of see other plates um, that we have taken pictures of in the past where sometimes you can have a lot more bacteria on the plate. Um, but you can really still see these dark blue colonies that we're gonna be counting here on these plates. So once we count our colonies on the plate, we are gonna record this on our field data sheet. Um, and in order to get these plates, uh, the, the E. coli plated, we have to um, pick a number of milliliters of sample that we take. So we do a little equation with the number of colonies we counted and the amount of sample we use to figure out our total colony forming units per 100 mils of sample. So with two colonies, we did three mils of sample. That would be 66.6 .6 colony forming units uh, per 100 mils. So that's just how we standardize that um, sample across all samples. So the standard for human contact is 235. So these samples are well below that standard for bacteria. So that would indicate that it would be okay to swim and touch and play in this water right now. Bacteria samples only last about 48 hours. So that can't tell us what happens tomorrow or if you should swim tomorrow or next week or next month. Um, it only really gives us this point in time um, information about bacteria. So our next sample is gonna be temperature. All right, um, so 
we measure, once we finish up with our bacteria samples, uh, we do that first again, because it's completely sterile. We don't wanna collect water that's been disturbed by our feet or any other equipment. So once we finish up with that, we jump into uh, air and water temperature. So we use these digital thermometers. They have a little protective cover on them. We do a couple of visual checks on our thermometer first, just to make sure that it's in working order. We make sure the battery is working. And uh, we look at the tip just to make sure it doesn't have any rust or dents on it or anything like that. So this one's looking pretty good. Um, and then we wanna take our air temperature, either standing in the shade or turning your back to the sun. We're in a pretty shady spot here. Uh, so I'm just gonna hold it here and wait for this to stabilize. And I just wanna make sure I'm not holding any of the metal part with my hand because that can change the air temperature. So we're still waiting for this to stabilize. Um, we're right around 33 degrees Celsius right now, which is pretty toasty. Uh, we'll probably drop a little lower than that. Uh, but typically we wait for this to stabilize uh, until it hasn't changed for about 10 seconds. So we're still dropping, we're getting to the low mid 32s still dropping a little bit. So this is pretty stable around 32.6. So if I'm with someone else, I'll say, hey Liz, our temperature is 32.6. Can you make sure you record that on our data sheet? And she'll write that down right when it happens because you're never gonna remember once you leave the field. When you're ready to do water temperature, we're just gonna go straight to the stream and stick our probe in the water. Um, we always do air temperature before water temperature, just because we don't wanna have a wet thermometer when we're taking any of our readings. So we'll go right over here. And we always make sure that we're collecting our water sample from an area that's representative of the stream around you. So right here, like I'm not in a super calm eddy or I'm not in like a running current that's only in a small part of the river. This is pretty representative of what's around us right now. So our reading right now is at 27.3, and that looks pretty stable right there. So I'm gonna have my monitoring partner, Liz, write down 27.3 on our data sheet. Got it, thank you. Uh, so when you're done with that, uh, you just make sure you dry it off. Normally just dry it on my leg. Uh, and then we put our covering back on, and then we put our thermometer away until next time. So that's probably one of the easiest parameters that we measure when we're out here. I'm going to turn it over to Liz for our next break. Awesome. The next parameter is pH and conductivity. And for this particular one, our, we have one Oakton um, meter that measures both of these parameters at the same time, which is super convenient. We actually just switched over to these meters, um, and they've been really, really helpful. So as Sophie mentioned, this is one of the parameters that we want to calibrate every time we go out in the field. Anytime you're using a meter or anything that has a digital reading, it's really important to make sure that it's reading properly. A lot of people put a lot of faith into um, the, these pieces of equipment and we still really need to make sure that we're doing all the proper checks. So we calibrate with pH and conductivity. We have standard solution that we'll check the meter against to make sure that it's always reading accurately. If those values start to drift over time, then we can just replace the electrode on this probe right here um, and get it updated so that the next month, the monitor can go out and collect those high quality samples. So, um, if you can see the screen here, we have a reading up here on the top and we have a temperature reading down here on the bottom. The temperature on this probe is not very accurate. So that's why we have a separate thermometer um, for this reading. So once we have the calibration that's done at home or prior to coming out in the field, it's really easy. We just turn the probe on when we're in the field. And again, just like Sophie did, we will um, take the cap off of the probe. You can see here, let's get a close up of what this looks like. So you can see this bulb right here is our pH and there's actually liquid in there. So we wanna make sure that it looks like this where it's clear, there's no breaks, um, there's no bubbles or anything like that um, on that clear part of the probe. And then our conductivity are these two black pieces if you can get 
an angle in there. Um, and the conductivity sends a signal between those two black pieces to read the value. Um, so we're just gonna, again, come in here and you can again do this either right in the waterway or you can do it in a bucket. And so right now this is reading our conductivity reading. So this is a freshwater system, which means the conductivity is gonna be pretty low in the hundreds, somewhere below 200 typically um, is gonna be our conductivity reading in a freshwater. Conductivity is directly related to salinity. So as the salinity increases, typically our conductivity will also increase. So again, we just are gonna wait till it stabilizes. And this, this probe is even better because it has this little smiley face that comes up on the screen when the reading has stabilized, which makes it really nice to read. So we're reading about 157.5 is the reading here. So again, um, that is really low. Uh, and ind indicative of being in a freshwater stream. So now I'm just gonna change it over to pH. And so you'll see this reading changed a little bit right here. We're now reading in the 8.16 range instead of that 100 range that we were in for conductivity. So again, we're just gonna sit here and wait for this to stabilize. Um, a typical range for pH is going to be 8.5 to 6.5. There are some headwater streams in Virginia that might go up to 9.5. Um, they might have a special standard, but anything between 8.5 and 6.5 is considered um, a good range for pH. All right, and it's looking like 8.03 is going to be our reading for pH. And once we're done, again, we're gonna, we wanna be really careful of that probe. So we're just gonna give it a little flick to try to get some of the water off the bottom of it. Um, and we'll put our lid back on and store it. Again, since we did the calibration prior to going out in the field, we are also gonna do a post sample check with those same standards that we used prior to going out in the field, just to make sure nothing happened while we were out in the field that would affect the readings. Um, and if it does, then we have to flag that data um, just to indicate that there might've been an issue in the field. So our next sample is gonna be dissolved oxygen, which Sophie will go through. Um, all right, so we're gonna chat about uh, dissolved oxygen, which is my favorite parameter to measure when we're in the field. Um, we use uh, the uh, Lamont Winkler titration kit, which has a bunch of chemicals in it. Um, we'll talk through what all these do in a second. Um, and so what we do is fill up uh, bottles with water in the field, and then we fix our sample, which means we add some reagents and chemicals to it. So the dissolved oxygen content can't change between when we leave the field and when we get home, because we do have a bit of processing of our sample to do when we get home. Um, so we measure dissolved oxygen in milligrams per liter. Uh, typically, we look for dissolved oxygen levels, uh, depending on where you are, around five milligrams per liter and higher. Uh, anything lower than that, especially anything lower than two milligrams per liter, can indicate that it's a dead zone and we need oxygen in our water for aquatic animals and plants to survive. Um, so typically in the summer, you see lower dissolved oxygen levels just because warmer water holds less oxygen than colder water. Um, so the first thing we do, uh, we take our sample bottles and we actually do two of these every month. Uh, just to save some time, we're doing one today. And we go and fill up our sample bottle. And when we're wading in, we wanna make sure we're not disturbing the ground. Uh, so it says as gentle as we can be. Um, ideally, we wanna sample upstream from us if we've walked in from downstream, but that's not really possible here. So when we're filling our sample bottles, just these little glass bottles, we do this very slowly and we wanna make sure that we're not getting any air bubbles in our uh, sample water. So I just submerge about half the bottle. So the mouth is still above the water. And then we start dropping the bottom of our bottle down. So water is flowing into this very slowly. And then you might see like one final air bubble leave. There we go. And we have our whole sample bottle submerged underwater. And I take my cap 
and I put it underwater as well. Make sure there's no air bubbles hiding in there. And I cap the bottle. So I take it out of the water and I check to make sure that I don't fall, uh, that there are no air bubbles in it. So we check this um, by flipping it upside down. And if you do have air bubbles, they'll float right to the top. If you check this way, they might be hiding under that black cap right there. So we flip it upside down. This one looks pretty good. I'm not seeing any air bubbles in there. If we did see an air bubble, we would just empty the sample water downstream of where we're standing and try again. So when we're ready to fix our sample, we're going to uh, add a few chemicals here. Clear up my workstation. So we take our cap off. And we're going to add two chemicals here. Um, we are adding a manganese sulfate solution and an alkaline potassium iodide as a solution. So volunteers are always like, I can't remember that. That sounds like really hard chemistry. All the bottles are labeled, they're different colors. We want this to be easy for you guys. So whenever we add drops, we add eight drops. So we always add our pink solution first. So we go one, two, three. So we've got our eight drops of that one. And then we put our caps right back on. And then we're going to add eight drops of our other one. And you'll see our uh, solution or our sample start to change color there. So we put our cap back on and this typically overflows the bottle because we want there to be no air bubbles in there. And then we give it a good mix. So we shake this a couple times and then we're actually gonna let this settle for a couple minutes, mix it again, and then add one more chemical, which is our sulfuric acid. Uh, to save time here, we've already done that part. So we're gonna skip ahead. So this is what our fixed sample looks like. So we have our cloudy one before it's fully fixed. And then this one is like a nice amber color that's really clear. Um, and this is good to go. So this is what we would take home and process at home. So now we're teleporting to our lab station at home where the next step would be to fill up your, your test tube with 20 milliliters of water. So there's lines on here and we're filled up right to that 20 milliliter line. So you would take your fixed sample and pour it in there. We've done that step for you here. And then we are going to titrate our samples. So we are basically going to add uh, another chemical called sodium thiosulfate. We are going to slowly add it to this sample to get our dissolved oxygen content using this titrator. So this isn't a needle, it's just um, a little plastic um, like dispenser. So there's numbers on here. And as we add this fluid, once this solution turns clear, we are going to look and see our reading on here and that will be our dissolved oxygen content. So just as a reminder, these are the stages that we'll be going through. If you wanna zoom in right on this. So we're right here at this dark yellow, we're going to turn it light yellow add something else to turn it this dark bluish purple and then continue our titration process until we turn clear. So we're gonna start doing that. So we're just gonna add a couple drops of solution at a time. So this is already filled with 10 milligrams uh, of solution or milliliter, sorry. And then we give it a little swirl, continue adding some more solution, keep swirling bug on my glasses. Ooh. There we go. Uh, and we're going to keep going until this gets lighter and lighter. And because we don't know what our content's going to be here, we do this really slowly. So you can see that's slowly starting to turn a lighter yellow. Do a couple more drops. All right. So then once we get to light yellow, we keep that solution in our titrator and we just rest that down. And then we add our starch indicator, and this serves as a dye to turn this whole solution a dark blue. So we've added eight drops of that. And just like everything before, we're always adding eight drops. And then we put our cap back on. There's a little hole in there, so we just make sure not to splash it. And we swirl this around so it's nice and mixed up. And then we're going to continue our titration process to get to that light blue and then ultimately clear. So we'll add a couple drops at a time. And you'll see when it starts to hit the surface of the sample water, it 
it turns clear pretty quickly, which is why we shake it. We swirl it around a bit. So we're getting lighter. We do a couple drops at a time. And in the summer, um, because our dissolved oxygen content will be lower, uh, this is a faster process. In the winter, this might take a bit of time to get to that clear stage. You can see we're at a really pale blue here. So we're gonna just do one drop and give it a swirl and see if that turns clear. Oh, and see how quickly that went. So that's perfectly clear right there. So that means we can look at the reading on our titrator. I don't know if you'll be able to see these numbers, um, but this is reading right at five, each line is two, so two, four, six. This is right at 5.6, which is pretty low, but pretty typical to see in the summer. Um, so that means that we have successfully gotten our dissolved oxygen content, and we make sure to record that on our data sheet. And again, we would do this twice every single month in the field. Um, typically, you're at home when you're doing this, not out in the field, because it's a little bit of a tedious process. But all of this is safe to go right down the sink. Um, so we just empty everything out and make sure we rinse everything out really thoroughly with warm water and let it dry before we um, pack it all up. All right, um, so I think we can move on to our next parameter. So I'll let Liz take over from here. Um, so our next parameter is going to be salinity. Um, again, we only monitor for salinity in tidal areas. We don't do salinity in non-tidal areas. Conductivity is going to be a better uh, parameter to monitor in those non-tidal areas to see changes in the water chemistry. So in our tidal areas, we are going to use a refractometer. That's this piece of equipment here. It's a pretty a pretty basic piece of equipment but surprisingly expensive actually um we don't really need to do a whole lot to maintain this um but we will put some dissolved oxygen or <laughs> dissolved oxygen <laughs> di water <laughs> um right on this faceplate. so this is where we're going to put our sample in order to read the salinity right here on this faceplate. um and so every once in a while we'll just check with di water um, and look through there and make sure that it's reading at zero with that deionized water. And if not, there's just this little piece right here where we can change how that sample is being read with that DI water in place. So when we're out in the field, there's usually a little dropper that goes with this. And again, we'll either take the sample right from our bucket or right from the waterway and we'll rinse off the face plate here. And then we'll put our sample, our drop samples of water and then cover that face plate. And the water will kind of create a whole layer across the face plate. And then we're just gonna close that lid. And we, it's important to look up into the sunlight to actually get sunlight down through here so you can see the reading. And when you look through that opening, this is what we are going to see. So you'll see a blue area and a white area. And where those two come together is going to be our salinity reading. So there's this scale over here on the left hand side of the um, of the screen. And that is our parts per thousand. So that's what we're recording the salinity. So in this particular example, we're right about 35 which is full salt water. That's what like the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay would read. Up here again, we're in fresh water. So this blue and white line would be down here closer to zero um, for the reading of this screen or for the reading of this stream. Um, so that's what you would see in this face plate. And then again, once you're done, we just rinse off the sample and put the piece of equipment away in our container. Um, I think that's all we need to know about salinity. <laughs> um, our last parameter is going to be turbidity or water clarity. I think we're looking good on time. Yeah. Um, all right, so we measure uh, water clarity in the field in an area like this using a turbidity tube. Um, so in 
turbid or water clarity is it's a measurement of how far down through the water column uh, light can penetrate. So when streams are really sedimented or after a big rainfall event, they're going to look cloudier. And that's because there's lots of suspended stuff in the water. So it's harder for light to get down there. Um, so we measure this using a turbidity tube, which has a uh, measurement scale on the side. And in the bottom, there is, you might be able to see that there's a black and white disc. Can you see that? There we go. Okay, there's a black and white disc down there um, called a secchi disc. Uh, and because this stream is so shallow, we use this tube that can measure up to 120 centimeters. Um, but in areas where the water's deeper, or if you're in a tidal region, we can use a larger version of this instrument. This is an actual secchi disc that has a rope attached to it with measurement markings along it. So if you're on a dock or a boat, you can lower that down off the boat to get your reading. So what we're doing is basically if you're using a secchi disc, you're lowering it down until you can no longer see the difference between the black and white pattern, making a note of that measurement and then pulling it back up until you can see it again and then you average those two measurements. Um, so it's the exact same concept here with the turbidity tube, but we're going to fill up the tube with water and then we're going to let water out on this little hose crimp uh, until we can see that black and white disc when we look down. Um, so we do a couple of visual checks before we do this. We make sure that our hose is working. We make sure that our uh, crimp is working so we can stop the flow of water and that there aren't any cracks on the tube. So when we're ready to do that, if you have a bucket, you can either just take your bucket of water and pour it in here, or you can wade directly into the stream. If you are wading in the stream, especially if it's a stream that's flowing a lot more, uh, you want to point your turbidity tube upstream so water can flow right into it and then just scoop that and have uh, water flow to the top. Here, it's not really flowing, so I'm just gonna very carefully wade in and submerge my tube to fill it up with water. All right, so we've got water flowing in. And we're right at the top, so we'll scoop it. And then we'll go back to a flat surface. And the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to let the water settle a little bit. And I'm going to look down and see if I can see that black and white disc. So here I actually can see it. I tried this earlier, but I think I had stirred up the ground too much with my feet, which is why we need to be really careful when we walk in. And you, so you can see the black and white disc right now. So I'm going to have Lucy see if you can look down there and see that black and white disc. Is that coming through? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, there we awesome. go. Awesome. <laughs> so we don't need it to be super clear. You just need to be able to distinguish between the black and white. Um, so in this case, this water is filled to the top. So uh, it exceeds the amount that this instrument is able to measure. So again, this measures 120 centimeters. Uh, so on our data sheet, we would write 120 centimeters, but mark that it is greater than that value. Um, using a secchi disc can be nice because you can lower it down up to, you know, three meters or however long your rope really is. Um, but here we're limited to just the extent that this equipment can measure. Um, if you could not see the black and white disc, what you would do, you could do this yourself or have a friend do it with you. Um, you're going to have them open that crimp to start to draw off some of the water. And then I'm gonna keep looking down until the black and white disc becomes visible. And as soon as it is, I'll say, okay, stop. And she'll close the crimp. And then we'll look on the side of our turbidity tube and record that reading. So if this is where I saw it, um, I would record this at 109 centimeters. Um, typically, if you're doing this after like a huge rainfall event, the next day, the water might be really sedimented. So you might be drawing off the sample until you know, you're know you almost down to 20 centimeters or something like that. Um, so it's really interesting. Sometimes you look at a creek and you're like, oh, like to me, this looks a little cloudy today. But then I look through the top and I was like, oh, water can still get really far down through that water column. Um, cool. Great. And this is measured in centimeters, um, which is a key distinguishing factor. The secchi disc is measured in meters. Um, so we just need to, we always do a double check to make sure that the reading is actually in centimeters. Um, cool. All right. When so, you're done with turbidity tubes, you can just dump out 
the water. Typically you do this last, so uh, you're ready to leave the field when you're uh, done with this one. Sounds good. So once you're done with all of your readings in the field, we will have the field data sheet. <laughs> Sorry, I should have waited. <laughs> we'll have the field data sheet completely filled out with all of our readings that we can take in the field. Again, we'll do dissolved oxygen. And if you're doing bacteria samples, you will do those back at your house or in an office space or whatever setting you go back to after monitoring. Um, and then we will have this data uploaded to the Chesapeake Data Explorer. So I mentioned in the beginning, we built this database that now houses all of the, or most of the volunteer-based or community-based water quality monitoring data throughout the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So our monitors will take the data from their field data sheet. They will log in to the Chesapeake Data Explorer and upload the data to the Data Explorer. And then they will send a hard copy of their field data sheets to Sophie. She gets lots of fan mail and loves talking with all of her pen pals, um, who will then double check the data, just making sure that the data is uploaded properly, that all of the calibrations are within range and to do any other data checks that we need to do before the data is published and therefore publicly accessible for anybody within the watershed, but also for DEQ and the Bay program to use. Um, so that's kind of all we have today, but if you guys are interested, um, Lauren can post a link to the Chesapeake Data Explorer in the chat box so you can see that. Again, all of you are more than welcome to go to the homepage of the Data Explorer, look at the map of all of our sites that we have throughout the watershed, and you can view and download any of the data that's published in the system. And if you are interested in getting involved and you are in Virginia and maybe DC a little bit and maybe Maryland a little bit, we are currently working on expanding into DC and Maryland. So we don't quite have as much of a robust program, but if you're in Virginia, you can feel free to go to the River Trends website and there is um, a volunteer intake form if you're interested in getting started or you can contact Sophie directly to get started. <laughs> um, we are currently doing trainings. We have a virtual option um, that's available, or we are doing a mix of in-person trainings as well. Um, so we can get you on the schedule for the next training that is convenient for you. So I guess, are there any questions that have come in over the last hour? We covered it perfectly. <laughs> I think we have one question. Um, there was a question about where could someone uh, procure the kits and all the equipment that you're using? Is that something that they can purchase through the Alliance or can we share links on how and where to purchase those? Yeah, um, so all of our River Trends equipment we get from a few different suppliers, um, but we have grants to, to provide this equipment to anyone who wants to monitor. Um, so if you're interested in having your own equipment and getting trained, we provide all the equipment to you. Um, yeah, it's, we, can, we can give you whatever River Trends equipment you need as long as it's within our uh, budgets for the year. If you're interested in just buying equipment and testing it out, um, we can send you links to the suppliers for all of the equipment or the specs so that you can just figure out if Amazon or uh, other places are the cheapest too. So again, you can email Sophie if you have questions about all of the equipment that we're using. But yeah, if you become a certified monitor, all of the equipment is provided to you by the Alliance, as well as your notebook, your methods manual, the field data sheets, all everything. We even provide you with the envelopes and stamps to send the data sheets back to us. We wanna make this as easy for you <laughs> as possible. Um, we also, there are a lot of people who are interested in measuring bacteria, especially if they live on the waterfront property and they have, you know, kids who swim in the river a lot or want to swim on their, or they swim themselves. Um, the bacteria kits, these are super accessible. You don't need any special equipment to collect these bacteria samples or process them as you saw. Um, but uh, just to put it, just to give you some sort of scale, it's about $35 for 10, uh, they're all single use supplies. So for 10 
uh, sets of supplies. It's about 30 bucks. Great. Great. Any other questions? Um, I have a question. Can you tell us what the water would look like if it had rained a lot the night before? What, you know, what kind of parameters would be showing up that, you know, maybe wouldn't look like if it had not rained? Sure. Um, I think one of, the, one of the biggest changes you would see is uh, when we were using the turbidity tube, um, that measurement would probably be down, I don't know, maybe like to 30 or 40 centimeters. I've been out at streams when uh, there's been a really big rain event and you know the water still might like look clear but that's why we use equipment to measure it because like your your eyes can't really determine that and we filled up a whole turbidity tube and it's looked relatively clear and we draw off that sample until it's down to like i've seen it go down to like eight centimeters so that's why equipment is super important um yeah the other thing here we're in so sophie mentioned we're in the james river park system in the city of richmond and the other big parameter that would change here uh, is bacteria. So we are in a combined sewer overflow system and typically with around a quarter inch to a half an, an inch of rain, we will start to see overflows from that system directly into the, chain, the James River where we are today. So we will start to see elevated bacteria levels and there are organizations across the city, since this is a big popular recreational area, there are organizations that monitor weekly throughout the summer in order to identify any areas that people should avoid on the weekends when they're most likely recreating. Great, and then um, this is a, a high level question. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the um, expected impacts to water quality from climate change and what we might uh, be already seeing in the Chesapeake or where the our water quality might be heading because of climate change impacts? Well, that's a big question, Kate. How much time do you, have? <laughs> you, you know I only ask big questions, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. So we're definitely seeing, we would definitely see a lot of impacts from climate change. Um, there's a few different ways that we can monitor that temperature is a big parameter and luckily through the CMC we do have a lot of widespread temperature data throughout the entire Chesapeake Bay watershed and we're actually one of our partners through the CMC right now UMSI is the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science is currently analyzing some of that temperature data to look at long-term trends across the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Um, and we are currently looking into seeing how that data could um, be used by the Chesapeake Bay program uh, climate change work group. Um, so temperature is obviously a big one, you know, with rising temperatures or more uh, differentiation in temperatures across the seasons, um, we're definitely going to see trends uh, with warmer water temperatures, which as Sophie mentioned when she was doing dissolved oxygen, warmer water temperatures hold less dissolved oxygen than cooler temperatures. So that really can affect our fish habitat up in the upper reaches of the watershed and our headwaters where um, a little bit of increased temperature can really reduce the amount of dissolved oxygen that's in the system. So again, dissolved oxygen will have an impact. And then our salinity um, as well as, you know, we get less fresh water inputs or more, more or less rain. It can depend if there's a big rainy season where we get tons of rain, we're going to see a lot more fresh water in some areas that might typically be salt water or brackish water. Um, and that can really change where the species can live and where they can thrive and survive. So that is the, that is the two minute answer to anything else to add. <laughs> That's great. Liz, we have, uh, Liz or Sophie, we have one question from Bill Fleming, um, who wants to know when does all hey, the Bill. <laughs> When does all the data get analyzed and by whom and how can somebody see the, re the results or conclusions from the data? Um, multiple part question there. Um, so the data gets published online as soon as we have the hard copies of your data sheets mailed in and I've had the time to do all of our quality assurance checks on them. 
Uh, from there, you can log on to the Chesapeake Data Explorer and click your, uh, your monitoring site if it's yours that you're interested in, Bill. Um, I actually have a stack of data that is not published at home, and I know yours is sitting in there, Bill. So my apologies, we'll get there. Um, but you can click on your monitoring site and see, uh, choose each parameter, and you can see little quick plots of like your dissolved oxygen trends, your pH trends, um, whatever parameter you want to look at is available to see on there. Um, from there, you can download the data and do some groups do like their own little bit of data analysis. Um, from there, uh, that's definitely something that we're working on, getting groups more engaged uh, with their data interpretation processes. Uh, and I know that um, UMSEs, as Liz mentioned before, does a lot of that data interpretation work. Uh, so if, if organizations want to create like report cards or something like that, they're the ones who go through to go through. Um, and they use your data and they can pull data from a lot of other different sources as well. We're also looking at how to upgrade the data explorer to maybe help with a little bit of that visualization. When we were originally building that database, um, we made the distinct decision to not include like the standards or to really do any of that, like what does this data mean on the data explorer, mainly because the standards change from state to state. So it's really hard to come up with like, this is the standard. And even within the state, it depends what your interest of using that water waterway is. So the standard for bacteria, for instance, of 235, that's the standard for human contact of a waterway. But if you were interested in shellfish or um, fishing or anything like that, there are different standards depending on what you are interested in. So definitely give us a call, contact us. We can help work through kind of what those standards might be that you're of interest. And as Sophie said, um, UMSEs is our partner to kind of help work through the data interpretation piece and really give us a picture of what this data means. Well, thank you, Liz and Sophie. I think we're at the end of our time together. That's the end of our questions. So thank you both for uh, standing out in the warm weather. Hopefully the mosquitoes <laughs> and bugs haven't been too bad. Uh, but thanks for all you do for helping um, our community scientists, our volunteers help collect data on in their own neighborhoods. So thank you for that. Um, I want to hey. Thank you uh, all of you for joining us, whether you joined us from Facebook or Zoom um, this afternoon. We appreciate you joining the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay on our Breakfast on the Bay series regarding community water quality monitoring. I just wanted to remind folks that um, we couldn't do this work without generous donors. And uh, this year, our board of directors and other leaders have put together a $25,000 match gift. And so every donation made to the Alliance this summer will be doubled um, and in, in honor of our 50th anniversary so we can continue to do this work into the next 50 years. Collecting baseline data to understand the health and quality of our rivers and streams is critically important. So um, if you are interested in other Breakfast on the Bay talks with the Alliance, we have two more events coming up. Uh, we have a stream study with Shank Mare Outfitters, which is on the banks of the Susquehanna River up in Pennsylvania. That'll be coming up on August 24th. And our, our final breakfast on the Bay uh, will be with our great partners at Eco Latinos on, um, in, on September 1st. Um, Eco Latinos is a group whose mission is to engage and educate the Chesapeake's Latinat community while fostering connections that reinforce stewardship and engagement. So thank you all for joining us um, and we hope you've learned something new today. Thanks everybody, have a good one. <laughs>